Good evening, my name is Maggie Zimansch. I will be co-hosting uh, this evening uh, in English. Uh, thank you everyone for being there. Um, I would like to acknowledge that we are here on Mohawk unceded land. Uh, so thank you for acknowledging that. Uh, so we have a panel of seven activists uh, from four different nations uh, across uh, so-called Canada and so-called Colombia. Um, this is a presentation from PASC, uh, which is the project of accompaniment and solidarity with Colombia. Uh, you can find, find out more information about this group uh, at the table in the back. Um, it is also a presentation of Submedia TV and First Nations Circle of UCAM. Um, I am a member of CRIP UCAM and I'm very happy to be here. Évidemment, c'est euh, très important pour nous de commencer la soirée en disant qu'on est sur euh, des territoires euh, Mohawk non cédés. Donc, euh, merci aux au Mohawk de nous accueillir ce soir ici. Euh, on va y aller un petit peu avec des, des petites choses très logistiques. Vous avez les toilettes qui sont ici à gauche, à droite, derrière moi. Pour la traduction, vous avez la traduction en français à gauche, ici, en anglais à droite. Euh, oui, ici, là. Puis, si vous avez besoin en espagnol, vous pouvez demander aussi. Ça se passe ici, vers la gauche, avec Philippe. Euh, on va commencer aussi par euh, des... La, la nourriture aussi, c'est euh, derrière, si jamais vous avez faim. Hein. Je vais commencer par remercier un peu toutes les personnes qui ont rendu possible euh, cette soirée. Évidemment, le PASC, Submedia, euh, le Gripcam, aussi toutes les personnes qui nous ont aidés énormément avec la bouffe, euh, Pipot Potatoes, euh, toutes les personnes qui nous aident avec la garderie, avec la, la table du PASC qui est derrière, la table de Submedia, toutes les personnes qui nous ont aidés pour l'organisation euh, de... Euh, de la salle, Christian qui filme aussi, Juliana, tous les helpers qui, nous ont, qui ont rendu cette, cette soirée possible. Avec euh, la tournée de notre camarade Philippe, on trouvait ça important d'organiser un événement euh, ici, euh, dans ce qu'on appelle Montréal, avec euh, différentes personnalités euh, autochtones sur la question du territoire autochtone et euh, des luttes pour la défense du territoire contre euh, l'industrie extractive et les pipelines. Comment ça va se passer la soirée Il va y avoir une présentation de 15 minutes environ de chacun des, des participants participants qui sont ici avec nous ce soir, qu'on a la chance de recevoir. Et euh, ensuite, il va y avoir une discussion échange avec euh, le public. Euh, il va y avoir aussi une projection de deux vidéos de Submedia à peu près au milieu de la soirée, puis une autre vidéo euh, qui sera projetée avant la présentation de euh, Shannon. Uh, so, um, technical aspects, uh, the toilets are here. Um, you will have a French translation over there in that corner where the hand is up. Um, you have a translation into English right here. Um, you have food in the back. Um, and so we will be um, having so se seven panelists talking for 15 minutes each. Uh, they will share their stories and experiences of struggle against pipelines and extractive industries uh, up in uh, here in so-called Canada and in Colombia. Um, okay, so yeah, okay. So first we will hear um, three speakers, uh, Natasha Canapi fontaine uh, who's a poet and Inu activist. We will then hear Shannon Chief from the Anishinaabe Nation of the Ottawa River Watershed. Um, she will be followed by Felipe, Felipe Incaccia, a delegate from the traditional authorities of the Uwa people in so-called so Colombia. Then we will have a 15-minute um, intermission with movies from Submedia TV presented. Um, after which we will hear Frida Hewson, sorry, uh, spokesperson for the Onis Toten camp. Uh, we will also hear Togestai, hereditary chief of the Laksama Sioux clan of the Wet'suwet'en nation. And a shared presentation by Marie-Hélène Parent, Métis activist and artist. And uh, André Picoutelecan, Inu traditionalist from Pessianit. Uh, the presentation will be in three languages, French, English, and Spanish. Um, it will be followed by a brief uh, discussion and question period. Uh, we will have to leave the room for 9.30, so that means that around 9.15, we're going to end uh, the evening. Thank you. Donc, c'est ça, il faut qu'on ait quitté la salle à 9h30, fait qu'à 9h15, on va essayer de finir cette belle soirée. On va commencer tout de suite avec Natacha Canapé-Fontaine, qui est une Inou originaire de Pessamit, qui a été forgée par différents événements comme les blocus des femmes Inou sur la, la route 138. Natacha, c'est une poète une militante qui euh, est très impliquée dans les arts visuels et aussi dans le mouvement euh, Idol No More. Donc, euh, Natacha, je vais te donner la parole.
Merci Mathilde. Koyen Domachek, je suis très contente d'être ici ce soir, très très honorée, euh, surtout avant tout de partager cette table avec mes frères et mes soeurs euh, euh, avec qui je partage les mêmes luttes, les mêmes luttes intérieures par rapport au territoire, mais les mêmes luttes euh, extérieures sur le territoire, sur le territoire imaginaire et surtout euh, la lutte pour euh, notre identité en tant que personne qui sont dans une relation euh, unique avec le territoire en tant que tel, le territoire euh, que l'on surnomme le Canada. Je remercie le Créateur de nous avoir rassemblés, nous, et d'être avec vous ce soir, et de, de, de donner lieu à, à cet événement. Je n'irai pas plus loin. Je vais aller dans une lecture de poèmes pour ouvrir le panel et pour aussi livrer mes propres sentiments de la meilleure manière dont je suis capable de le faire. Prologue Ma forêt pleure toute seule en silence. Alice Jérôme et ma terre assise sous mes pieds boit ce silence. Assis en Inou veut dire terre. Au départ, il n'y a qu'elle, son ventre et son royaume. Sa cosmogonie du règne animal et végétal. Les arbres, les eaux, les loups et les hordes de caribous. Puis il y a le peuple, les Inou. Il y a moi, forte d'un nouvel éveil. Il m'aura fallu voir un mouvement transformer le visage des foules, de ma province, de mon pays, pour que je puisse atteindre cette force du tonnerre d'un espoir grandiose. Une eau précieuse, une eau vive, une eau féroce. Je danse sur le fleuve manœuvrant le gouvernail de la roue de la médecine. Ma soif est un manifeste. Puis il y a l'Alberta, Fort McMurray, à Tabasco, où je bute, où je me blesse, où je hurle la famine de mon peuple, où je dirais à tout l'univers Cesser le massacre. Je regarde autour, je ne vois pas mes enfants, ils ne sont pas encore nés. Mes grands-parents sont tous partis sans rien me dire. Ils n'ont pas prévu ce qui suivrait la lutte, la résistance. Ils sont, silen ils sont silencieux de l'autre côté et ne parlent pas. Les esprits, eux, dansent. Ils dansent sur le fleuve. Ils dansent sur le pays. Je reçois leur vision. Dites-moi, aujourd'hui, qui croit aux prophéties? Je viens de cette lignée, de la lignée des chasseurs et des bras. Je suis la fille de ceux qui marchent dans les rêves la petite fille des chamanes et des guérisseurs, la sœur de ceux qui parlent aux ancêtres. Je suis celle qui suit leurs traces à moins 40 degrés Celsius la nuit aux abords du fleuve. Redonner à ma mère le cas son origine, lui dire je l'aime, embrasser sa joue mille fois jusqu'à l'heure du retour. Ma terre, je la prendrai dans ma main, je la soignerai avec un pan, ma jupe, 
essuiera ses larmes noires, mes cheveux ses joues creuses, je la bercerai en ses tremblements, je ne dors plus, l'endormirai sur mes genoux et saluerai mes ancêtres de la mer avec le bégaiement, l'enfant à naître que je suis. Abat-moi le dos, les membres, ma croix, je la porterai tatouée sur mes peaux sales, l'hiver en nos grands ébats. Je ne suis pas pays frontière, je suis nation nombreuse multiple, multipliée jusque sous ta peau de pâle rougeur. L'heure tapante mes veines, le monde est corps, non, tu me dis, je ni, je me lance sans fin, ton esprit tu es ma révolution. Ma folie si précaire, pénombre, péchousse, roche de sion, mon ma mère. Tu n'as pas su lire que je te parlais de l'aube, la dimension parallèle qui nous sied sous les mains. Selon ma vie, mon âme, tu n'entends pas. Tu es, Occident, arrogance en tes scènes, mon amour et pardon et personne. De toute crise d'où je viens, il est impossible, ils disent, d'aimer plus loin que la mort. Espoir que tu me sois féroce. Histoire, je te dédie la dernière de mes chansons. La sœur, la terre est sœur avec la mère. Je suis l'épouse adultère du fleuve, j'ai quitté loin mon pays, où mes pieds se baignent du repos des ancêtres. Et l'écume qui me sert de savon sans jarret. Bu l'eau de mes rivières, les algues gondolent, brillent de miracles. Il y a fête ce soir. Et les, créatures, et les créatures sous mes jupes que je danse, que je tape du pied au milieu des femmes, ma douleur que je l'écrase, et je me ferai femme avec les anguilles de mon peuple. J'ai mémoire suffocante. Si des plus belles épaves forestières des orignaux blancs. Mes yeux voyageurs m'ont dit que grand-père n'a pas peur. Il n'a peur de rien. Je suis Trois femmes en une. Je suis la fille, la mère, la grand-mère. Je suis ma grand-mère, ma mère, moi. Je suis la lune, la terre, la mer, ma mémoire, mes entrailles, mon sang. Un tremblement de territoire, un grondement d'enceinte. Le cœur, les matrices vidées. Je heurte un tambour immense à sécher. Je me retire et corse les mots. Où la colère a sué, où la colère a bûché bras. J'ai pelé l'ivresse et l'écume et la mousse d'une seule main. L'hiver ne vous a pas éprouvé comme il le devait. Ne vous a pas démontré la racine la plus vive. Il est dit que le monde a couru jusqu'ici. Des bâtons marquent d'un trait le sol gelé sous la dérive des peuples qui concassent. Les yeux bandés, le chemin à garnir. Ma grand-mère gravit les montagnes. La baie est un fleuve dans un seul fruit. Je lave mes vêtements dans un cercle de métal. Je m'appellerai à nouveau Braise et l'écorce. Reprendrai le nom de mon père. Me souviendrai de la naissance des cieux, mon peuple. Je reprendrai les anguilles les redonnerai à la mer et je redeviendrai le pays que mes ancêtres 
ont bâti jadis sur les abords du fleuve. Je suis la femme qui tombe du ciel, la colline difforme, la fonte glaciaire, la force née des geôles calamités. Les doigts sur les yeux, je t'embrasse comme si tu étais un frère. Je suis la femme qui tombe du ciel, les batailles sont noires pétrole, les drapeaux se déchirent sous les pas. Plus personne le cœur ne bat dans les rues. Plus personne ne combat sur la route, plus personne le visage est rouge peint. Je suis la femme qui tombe du ciel, je n'ai rien semé pour nourrir mon espoir, je n'en ai pas gardé pour moi. La matière, l'espace, le corps, les jambes balancent les pieds sur l'asphalte, L'univers est grand pour l'amour que je m'étende sur les toundras hérissés. Assis, vie, le poème est ici, à manifeste, il marquera le temps. Un cercle se définit, un aura la lune, un halo le soleil. Je reviendrai peuple d'eau, je recracherai quatorze torrents, j'avalerai trois lunes pour mieux boire le lait de ma mère. Shannon Chief. Uh, she's from the Anishinaabe Nation of the Ottawa River watershed um, called Anor. Uh, Shannon is one of 13 com com committee members uh, to Anor, a nonprofit committee, who volunteered to put up together in writing their nation's traditional governance, closely guided by their elders. This approach was engaged at the outcome of the last court proceedings following their action camp in 2014, when they were denied a voice to cease the massive clear cuts on their territory because they did not meet the requirement of, a, of their nation having a governance in place to protect their ancestral grounds. Other environmental challenges um, await the Anishinaabe Nation. Um, they are fight facing mining projects. Uh, which in the long, long term are threatening furthermore the waters, uh, the hunting grounds, the medicines, the cultural and sacred sites, and leave the animals in danger and without no current sanctuaries uh, available for them. She believes the pipeline is a national risk to humanity if it is not stopped. Shannon is also a member of the Original People's Caucus, a growing national committee that is promoting an indigenous lead to the People's Social Forum. So, Shannon, Shannon Sheaf. Um, my English name is Shannon Chief. Uh, my spirit name is uh, White Polar Bear Woman. I'm also from the Wolf Clan family. Um, the Anishinaabe 
nation of the Ottawa River watershed is basically following the rivers of the Ottawa River up to St. Laurent and going up this way. But I'd have to have a map to really show you how the territory looks like, and it's an unceded territory. So an unceded meaning that our nation has never made any, um, uh, we've never ceded the land, we've never given up for it or made a treaty for it, nor ever lost in war for it. So I was, uh, before I ever got involved uh, helping our people, which has now become helping our nation back home, because it had to do with protecting the whole territory. What started out was just protecting our family territory back home. Uh, I've watched my mom and my family um, give their lives to try to protect the territory, which is um, our inherent right to speak for, coming from a family, to a nation of people. This is how the old government system uh, was like for our people. We had family territories, and these family territories are the people that you go see if cutting was going to be asked to be done in that area, but all the old ways is completely ignored today. But we still follow that coming from uh, a traditional group of uh, people that are very active right now. So I was a teacher for a while uh, at one of our communities and it was through a dream that awakened me to start taking more actions to help because I've seen through this, dr this dream where um, there was mining coming in, there was um, forestry activity happening where the animals were running around and they had no place to be, to be protected. And on the other side of that dream, we ha I seen uh, our own people fighting, which is the reality of what's going on right now is that we have uh, one side of the people that don't want forestry to happen, they don't want mining, they don't want maybe the pipeline that's supposedly supposed to come in as well. And it's hard because you have to fight against your own people for them to understand what is common sense and what is not right for the people or what's not right for the animals, what's not safe for Mother Earth, basically. So I helped out for the first time last summer to uh, <clears throat> To, to give my time in protecting the land and advocating for the land because it also um, this also bring, puts me back in my role as a teacher the land the language we cannot teach language if we don't have the land that's just how it works for us as um, uh, native language teachers so culture as well if we don't have uh, sanctioned areas we won't be able to teach culture for our children in the future because for us, culture is um, practicing sovereignty. Sovereignty is being able to pick up blueberries with your children and teach them that way of life. To pick up medicines that we have in the roots or on the barks of the tree or the plants that, that you see out there. And it's also being able to eat the, um, our, our wildlife food that we've always uh, been taught, uh, which is part of our way of life. So when I started um, uh, getting involved on an action camp, um, I, I've, I had to do a lot of observation. I had to listen to the elders and um, we had to work uh, as a group. That was the only way to uh, start getting things done by working as a group that were willing to be there. And our nation, has about 11 communities that I know. So there's like 11 chiefs, but we don't have that much people willing to come out to you know, put themselves on the front lines. But when you think about the old governance system, you have the clan system. So the first, the first clan people that are supposed to be there to defend the land are the wolf clan and the bear clan. So that's what we end up following as the front line um, people to defend the land. So that was our calling, that the people that are there are, are who are supposed to be um, st 
start to start this off by defending the land. So when you think about all the cuts throughout the years, um, I've, I've seen my, fa my family get arrested one by one trying to protect the land. And they've been in court for over seven, this was like 2007, and they're still in court. We've heard recently that the charges are going to be uh, dropped, which is good. But still, uh, every each court case that were, uh, that were brought to the system, it was always ignored. The last, the last court case that we had, they said, we cannot take in your, your say into this clear cut that's going on presently because you do not have a governance system. So this changed our whole um, approach on how to try to find a way to protect the land. We want to protect the land because the way we see it out there, you have these big machines that go out there really big big machines and they can do the work of what used to take a thousand people just to make a, a, a load but today they have all these machines that can do all that within minutes and that's even more trees that are get, being cut so with these machines that go in <clears throat> if you know how many of them look like they're just huge and they just go up they just pick a day to go out in certain areas and they don't not, there's nobody to address to the animals, you know, there's gonna be clear cuts coming. Nobody does not think about these little animals. And these little animals have babies. There's animals that live in trees and nests underneath the ground. So it's more of the little animals that are being affected right now from these massive cuts. And what I mean by massive cuts is that as of the, Three years ago, from, every, from all the information we've been picking up, they're there seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And the only time that we do not see them um, come out of the um, uh, forest uh, is Christmas, New Year's, and hunting season. And the rest of the days it's cutting 24 hours a day. So this is... Um, this is going to be a big impact on also the climate. It's less air to breathe for all, every each one of us. And then when you think about resources, when you think about what, why do they need so much trees? The hardest part about it is that it's to feed and shelter everybody in the cities, in the states, or even uh, um, across the seas, you gotta make uh, papers to educate your children. You gotta make wood to build a house and everything. So we always try to think back about the solutions. What is the next solution so that we can provide for everybody on Earth, basically, without having to cut so much trees and take away our culture and our rights to the land as well? You know, I always think that. The more that we try to meet from nation to nation, and with the new, hopefully it does pass, as they say it will, with this new um, uh, legalizations for what you call marijuana, I'm hoping out of it that we can start uh, looking into hemp that will replace uh, other apart than taking away trees. Because with this, it's like it's a solution that it's a new solution for all our people, for plastic, for wood products, you know, it's, it's, it's more sustainability. Uh, for the wood products, you know, it would, it would only be good for maybe 40, 50 years and then it, uh, the bugs start eating into them and then you gotta cut again, you know, you know what I mean? So that's, it's not a sustain, it's not a sustainable. So, those are some of the things we're looking at. This is why I also got involved with the social forum because I've seen it as um, a bridge to start working with people like you here and working with all different nations and people from overseas also that are also struggling with these things. So the other kind of struggles that we are looking at today too for our people is uh, a sacred site over by the 
by Ottawa is being uh, developed for to bring in condominium and nobody stops it. This takes away the strength of what guides our people today. So the other thing that our nation will be looking at is in 2016 we have a massive mining projects coming in to a park La Verandry, what they call the wildlife park. So that's something else that we have to prepare ourselves for. And also the uh, Trans-Canada Pipeline. The hardest part about all these struggles is that it's, all, it's our own people that are in there making all these uh, decisions to take in these kind of uh, projects. And it, it's hard to try to, to try to stand up to your own people because you don't want to hurt them too. But we try to guide them as much by involving our elders. So this is how we came together to form a committee to make a new governance system that will unify our nation because really our nation is not very united. So this is a, it's a big start for us because uh, we have a constitution which is under the, the pike's head. If you break that apart, there's the Anishinaabe beliefs and values of the people. And to write it into paper it took a lot of time for people, but it's something that we're hoping to bring back because it's the only way that we can sanction um, the territory that we have the responsibility to take care of. So I just want to say miigwech for having me here. I'm very open to answering your questions. And because we're a nonprofit committee, I have these on sale for $5 that helps uh, our people do the work, and my friend over here has them if you want to see them during the break or after. And so, anyway, I just want to say to me, guys, for having me here. On va donner maintenant la parole à Felipe Encasias. Felipe, il est délégué des autorités traditionnelles du peuple Oua en Colombie. Et il participe à la défense du territoire contre les différentes entreprises qui convoitent les richesses de, de, de ces territoires. Euh, on a la chance d'avoir Felipe avec nous aujourd'hui parce qu'avec le projet accompagnement Solidarité Colombie, on a organisé une tournée de deux semaines avec lui dans un but de rencontre et d'échange solidaire entre les peuples. Donc on a on est allé avec lui rencontrer différentes personnes dans les communautés autochtones. Donc on a la chance de l'avoir avec nous aujourd'hui. Primero que todo, muy buenas noches. Gracias por recibirme acá en la Universidad Nacional. Premièrement, un grand merci. Bonsoir à tous et merci de me recevoir ici dans l'Université Nacional. Gracias a los coordinadores de la parte logística que de este evento tan importante. Merci aux organisatrices, organisateurs de la partie logistique de cet événement si important. Para nosotros, el pueblo indígena Uba, el tiempo, pues, es muy corto, no, nos gustaría hablar mucho más, pero como aquí en la parte occidental es más limitado, de como no estoy en el territorio, pues me toca que acogerme bajo las reglas de ustedes. Alors, pour nous, pour nous, le, le peuple Oua, le temps est très court ici, dans le monde, dans le monde occidental, le temps est limité. Comme je ne suis pas sur mon territoire, je vais devoir me plier à vos règles. Bueno. En Colombia, las comunidades indígenas somos 103 pueblos indígenas, 84 lenguas indígenas diferentes. En Colombia, nous sommes 130 pueblos autóctonos que hablan 84 lenguas diferentes. Somos un pueblos de resistencia, de lucha y de movilización. Nous sommes des pueblos de resistencia, des pueblos de lucha. Des de Somos un pueblo que venimos luchando más de 524 años. Nous sommes des peuples qui luchamos desde plus de 524 años. Antes nos mataban, ahora nos están asesinando ideológicamente, políticamente, culturalmente, espiritualmente. Avant, ils nous tuaient. Maintenant, ils nous assassinent idéologiquement. Siempre los pueblos indígenas hemos venido preservando, protegiendo 
qui salvaguardando il territorio. Depuis toujours, nous, les peuples autochtones, nous avons protégé, nous avons préservé le, le territoire. Estamos luchando en contra las compañías de hidrocarburos y de minería. Nous luttons contre les compagnies d'hydrocarbures et les compagnies minières. Mi pueblo indígena Uwa siempre ha luchado. Mon peuple Uwa a toujours été en lutte. Y ha colocado un grito en el mundo desde el año 2009. Et mon peuple a lancé un cri au monde en 2009. Que los territorios que los ríos no se pueden contaminar. Que los territorios, que los fleuves no pueden ser evoluidos. Ni tampoco podemos aceptar proyectos que vienen empobreciendo a los pueblos indígenas. Y que no podemos tampoco aceptar proyectos que empobrecen a los pueblos autóctonos. Porque nosotros sí pensamos en el futuro. Porque nosotros sí pensamos en el futuro. No solamente pensar en el día de hoy, hay que pensar en el día de mañana para las nuevas generaciones. Nous ne pensons pas seulement à aujourd'hui, mais également à demain pour les prochaines générations. Pero hoy andamos preocupados en Colombia. Mais aujourd'hui, nous sommes très inquiets en Colombie. Porque el gobierno colombiano viene implementando las políticas minero energéticas en todo el territorio nacional. Parce que le gouvernement est en train d'implanter ses politiques néolibérales minéro-énergétiques à la grandeur du territoire. A accélérado la politique d'extraire de recursos de hidrocarburos et de minerías dentro de los territorios indígenas, campesinos, abros et comunidades indígenas. Ils ont accéléré la stratégie d'extraction des ressources de hydrocarbures et minières, tant dans le territoire des communautés afrodescendantes que dans les territoires autochtones et euh, dans les, les terres paysannes. Hemos tenido un desplazamiento de compañeros indígenas. Hemos tenido asesinatos de líderes que defienden lo, los derechos de los pueblos indígenas y de los campesinos. Nous avons connu des déplacements forcés des communautés autochtones. Nous avons connu des assassinats des leaders qui défendent les droits, qui défendent les droits des peuples autochtones et les droits des paysans. Todos que luchan por defender los derechos, por defender los derechos colectivos de un pueblo, de una sociedad, son criminalizados y también judicializados. Tous ceux qui luttent pour défendre les droits, pour défendre les droits collectifs, sont, pour défendre les droits de la société, sont aujourd'hui criminalisés, judiciarisés. Hoy en día, la justicia ordinaria o la la justicia occidental ha sido más duro para los, líderes, para los líderes comunitarios, pero ha sido más flexible para los narcotraficantes o los que han matado y han asesinado bastantes personas. Aujourd'hui, la justicia la, la justice occidental est de plus en plus dure envers les leaders qui défendent les droits, mais de plus en plus, de plus, en plus faible envers les narcotrafiquants, envers ceux qui assassinent le peuple. Comme, aussi, comme disait mes compagnies, en Colombie, il existe beaucoup de normes, beaucoup de lois, ils sont très bons pour sortir des normes, mais ils ne les appliquent pas. Pour sortir des normes. Comme disait euh, une camarade, en Colombie, il y a plusieurs normes, il y a plusieurs lois. Ils sont très bons pour développer des nouvelles normes, mais très peu pour les appliquer. Parce que les lois la construisent en favor de les compagnies ou empresas multinationales. Parce que les lois sont construites pour les entreprises, les compagnies transnationales. Mais ils ne la construisent en favor de la société colombienne, de les plus protégés. Mais ils ne construisent pas ces lois en faveur de la société colombienne des plus défavorisés. Los pueblos indígenas y todos los movimientos sociales en Colombia hemos venido trabajando. Los pueblos autóctonos, en concert con todo el movimiento social en Colombia, nos trabajamos ensemble por construir una propuesta alternativa de cambio de país. A fin de construir una, una proposición alternativa para cambiar el país. Es así que hemos venido presentando al gobierno nacional propuestas importantes. C'est à travers ce processus que nous avons présenté des propositions très importantes au gouvernement national. En le thème de la terre, de la santé, de l'éducation, 
medio ambiente y también el tema agropecuario. Des propositions au niveau des terres, au niveau de la santé, au niveau de l'éducation, de l'environnement, mais également au niveau euh, du thème agraire et des pêches. Son, son propuestas que se han construido desde los procesos comunitarios y los movimientos sociales de Colombia. Ce sont des propositions qui ont été construites à travers des processus communautaires qui viennent des mouvements sociaux. Pero el gobierno no quiere aceptar las propuestas de los pueblos. Mais le gouvernement ne veut pas accepter les propositions qui viennent du peuple. Hoy, hemos construido un espacio tan importante a nivel nacional. Aujourd'hui, nous avons construit un espace très important au niveau national. A través de las luchas que hemos tenido. A través de las luchas que nous avons menées. En el año 2014, construimos un espacio importante y político y jurídico. En 2014, nous avons mis sur pied un espace national politique et juridique. Un espace d'interlocution entre le gouvernement et les secteurs populaires de Colombie. Un espace politique d'interlocution entre les mouvements, les différents secteurs sociaux de Colombie et le gouvernement. Qui est la mesa campesina ethnique et populaire. Qui est la, la table de négociation euh, paysanne, populaire et ethnique. Donde les campesinos organisés présentent leur propuesta et leur agenda. Où les paysans euh, organisés proposent leur agenda, leur proposition. Ha sido muy difícil con, negociar con el gobierno. Mais il a été très difficile de négocier avec le gouvernement. Porque el gobierno no quiere negociar lo económico, lo político, lo territorial y lo hidrocarburo. Parce que le gouvernement ne veut pas négocier des termes que sont les termes économiques, économico-politiques, les termes de territoire, les termes des, des terres et de, des hydrocarbures. Para nosotros concretar esas propuestas y lograr ganar algo importante como es el cambio del modelo, tenemos que luchar. Y va a falloir luchar para poder concretizar nuestras proposiciones y cambiar realmente el modelo de desarrollo. Y materializar esas propuestas que nosotros hemos construido. Y materializar las proposiciones que nos hemos construido. A través del proceso de lucha y movilización. Que nos hemos construido a través del proceso de lucha y de movilización. El gobierno dice que no podemos negociar lo económico, lo hidrocarburo, pero le hemos dicho, si ellos no negocian con nosotros, pues tocará que negociarlo en las calles. El gobierno nos dice que no quiere pas negociar la cuestión de los hidrocarburos y del territorio, pero nos le hemos respondido que si no negocian con nosotros, Ce sera dans la rue qu'on négociera alors. Non, c'est un concept ni un significat de révolutionnaire ou esquerdiste. C'est une nécessité que nous anhela les secteurs populaires à résoudre nos problèmes. Ce n'est pas une revendication révolutionnaire, c'est juste euh, une aspiration nécessaire pour les différents secteurs sociaux. C'est pour ça qu'il est très important aujourd'hui de pouvoir exprimer devant vous ce, ce que nous pensons. Hoy los diálogos de paz no se están tocando temas tan importantes. Hoy las negociaciones PEC entre les FARC y, y uh, a la Habana y el gobierno, parentes de la traductrice, uh, ese diálogo de paz no toca los temas importantes que son uh, los temas de territorio, mina y hidrocarburos. Porque el gobierno ha puesto condiciones frente a ese proceso. Porque el gobierno ha uh, a imposer ses propres conditions dans ce processus de négociation. Et pour ça, les mouvements indigènes, nous avons venu pensant que nous préoccupe beaucoup. Nous me préoccupe beaucoup pour ce qui ne va pas accomplir ce qui se vient travaillant et ce qui se vient accordant dans ces dialogues de paix. C'est pour ça que nous, les peuples autochtones, nous avons peur que, euh, que ne soit pas matérialisé, que ne soit pas appliqué les accords qui sont négociés en ce moment dans le dialogue de paix. Hoy, en estos días, hice un recorrido por todas las, por todas eh, eh, las comunidades indígenas de aquí, de Quebec, todo lo que tiene que ver con la provincia y aquí también en, Montre en Montreal, conociendo la problemática que ellos tienen. En los últimos días, he estado en tournée para visitar diferentes comunidades autóctonas en la provincia de Quebec, también en de Montreal, para conocer la problemática aquí. Es preocupante por la situación y las garantías que el gobierno de este país no tienen a favor de los pueblos indígenas. 
Et c'est une situation très préoccupante. Le gouvernement ne donne aucune garantie au peuple autochtone ici. Et un des propósitos mío es generar confianza, generar unidad y, y tener interlocución. Y uno de mis objetivos en estar aquí es de generar la confianza de las alianzas entre nosotros. Con los pueblos indígenas hermanos de este, de este país. Con los pueblos frères, los pueblos autóctonos frères de este país. Yo convoco también a los seguidores, simpatizantes, estudiantes, en apoyar este proceso. Je convoque également les sympathisants, les étudiants, les alliés à appuyer nos processus. Este proceso que tiene alternativa futurista y ambientalista y pervivencia. Ce processus qui offre des alternatives dans le futur de, de survivance. Para la humanidad. Pour l'humanité. Gracias. Merci. Beaucoup, Felipe, on est vraiment contente et contente de t'avoir avec nous aujourd'hui. On va poursuivre avec la présentation de deux vidéos de Sub Media. Je vais laisser Franklin les présenter. Ces vidéos-là vont introduire la présentation de Frida et de Togesai. Uh, salut. Um, un moment pour le projecteur s'est uh, chauffé. Pardon pour, mes, pour ma français. Uh, my name is Frank, and I am part of an anarchist film collective called Submedia. And um, I've been doing a lot of uh, film work about indigenous struggles uh, for the past seven years. And I just want to show you a couple of films uh, about indigenous struggles um, out west and also uh, out here, out in the east. Um, I have a whole lot uh, of videos on uh, Submedia.tv. Um, the first one is about an anti-fracking struggle in, uh, in so-called New Brunswick that happened in 2013. Uh, this was a Mi'kmaq territory, and this is a, a, um, a fracking company from the United States called SWN. And this one is called uh, a Showdown on Highway 147. Mi'kmaq territories in so-called Rexton, New Brunswick, October 17th. 2013. At approximately 7.30 a.m., over 200 cops of the Royal Colonial Mounted Police, or RCMP, descended on a Mi'kmaq protest camp that had been blockading fracking exploration equipment owned by Texas-based Southwestern Energy, or SWN. The Mi'kmaq are the original inhabitants of this land and have been engaged in a struggle against SWN and their intent to frack their territories for natural gas since earlier this summer. The cops came in guns drawn with safety saw and several of them were outfitted with camouflage and carried semi-automatic rifles. They had surrounded the encampment where members of the Mi'kmaq Warrior Society were staying. They came in through the far exit, the far entrance near the highway with probably about 75 to 100 cops on that end. There were shots fired at one point. I believe one of the, peop one of the people in camo was firing in the air. I then saw Molotov cocktails being lobbed at heavily armed cops by people hiding in the woods. I was then kicked out of the conflict zone by a senior officer and threatened with arrest. If you do happen to come back, sir, I'm just saying, I'm not saying you are, but if you do, you will be placed under arrest. I refused to go behind the police line and kept the position where I could witness the events and avoid arrest for as long as possible. Attention! Attention! You are prohibited from hindering, interfering, or obstructing access to the staging area and storage facility or obstructing or impeding traffic. Anyone that continues to do so a tense standoff continued for the next two hours. I could hear supporters gathering from behind a police line in the town of Rexton. And we're not leaving. Mi'kmaq supporters were able to break through the RCMP line 
and were rapidly headed in the direction of the blockade while singing songs. At this point, I could see the police were panicking. The cops in camouflage moved in on the warrior encampment and another group of police formed a line to meet the supporters, effectively pushing me out of the conflict zone. Scuffles between police and supporters of the warriors followed and a fierce standoff between Mi'kmaq youth and the RCMP continued throughout the day. The cops used pepper spray and beanbag rounds on the crowd, which included many underage youth. Anger at the police was at a boiling point, and in fear, the cops abandoned their cars and moved to the safety of the police line. At around 1.30 p.m., supporters were asked to put down their cameras while people set the RCMP vehicles aflame, to the cheers of many. Fire trucks were told to turn around and let the cop cars burn. The cops continued to amass behind the police line. Cops in full riot gear, armored personnel carriers, and dozens of snipers filled the blockade site. But the fearlessness of the Mi'kmaq people was unquestionable, and they would not leave until the RCMP invaders were gone. Around this time, reports started coming in that all SWN equipment had been removed. Finally, around dusk, after arresting over 40 people, the cops retreated and left the zone. On Saturday, hundreds of people from all over Turtle Island descended on the blockade site. The corporate media were told by locals that they were not welcome and were ordered to leave the area. I stood up. I stood up and told him to get the fuck out of here. <laughs> As reports of solidarity actions from around the globe came in, people blocked Highway 11 for several hours, signaling to the world that resistance against southwestern energy will continue until all frackers are gone. Turtle Island descended on the camp and reoccupied the camp that had been kicked down by the RCMP and for the m next month and a half engaged in a, in, a, in a campaign of blockades, sabotage and intimidation of SWN workers until eventually SWN got tired of uh, losing over $60,000 a day when they were not doing exploration and then they left the zone in December 4th I believe uh, to, and that was a great victory so Um, so this next video is, uh, is about the Onestoten camp. Uh, you're going to hear these amazing folks here in a second. Um, I've been following the Onestoten camp since uh, 2010 when I went to the first action camp over there, and it was only about 12 of us who went to the action camp. And this is about the second action camp. It's, uh, it's about how it grew by leaps and bounds on that second year. Um, and for people who, are, who have been following the struggle, I think it's pretty interesting to see some of the faces that we've seen for the past five years, what they looked like a few years ago and what the camp looked like uh, back in 2011. Uh, so this one is called uh, the Action Camp. Wet'suwet'en Territories, August 2012. A few comrades and I hit the road to join dozens of people in the third annual Unistotin Action Camp a convergence called by members of the Wet'suwet'en Nation to prevent oil and gas pipelines from entering into their territory. As we sped away from the visual noise of the city, the natural splendor of the Pacific Northwest revealed itself. Canyons, rivers, lakes, and mountains beckoned us to abandon our gasoline-powered chariot and invited us to walk and swim through them and leave behind the spectacle of industrial civilization. But even in these remote areas, the insatiable appetite of capitalism 
demands of further ravaging of nature, mining highways, dams, clear-cut logging, and now oil and gas infrastructure are not only defacing the landscape, but also the cultures that have lived in this region for millennia. We're opposing these projects because we have very few areas that are pure and still in a natural state. For example, the river behind us, we actually can still drink that water and we still hunt this area and industry has destroyed most of our areas and we have very little left and we're going to fight to protect that for the future generations, our children, grandchildren. If we don't protect it, there'll be nothing here and we'll be saying that uh, we used to have moose and we used to have fish and they're not even going to know that as part of their diet if we don't step up and start protecting it today. After driving for over 1,000 kilometers, we arrived at the boundary of the Unistoten land, the pristine Maurice River. But before any of us could cross the bridge and enter the territory, we had to follow the free, prior, and informed consent protocol. Protocol is uh, ancient. It's thousands of years old. The land taught us how to do this, to protect it. Also to see you act out your knowledge of self, which helped us keep the integrity of the land and uh, the people. So free prior informed consent is nothing new. It's been asleep for a couple of hundred years because of colonization. Our responsibilities were taken from us, from military and from police and from oblates, Catholic Church. Uh, pretty much put the fear into our ancestors a couple hundred years back, uh, telling them that they can no longer act on their lands in the ways that they have. Much of the area of what is now known as British Columbia is made up of land that was stolen from indigenous communities. The Unistoten clan of the Wet'suwet'en Nation are asserting the rightful ownership of this forested wilderness to stop a natural gas transport project called the Pacific Trails Pipeline, or PTP. Well, the PTP project uh, is a project that um, kind of snuck through under the radar. It's a pipeline project that's proposed by the Apache Corporation. And uh, they want to run a natural gas pipeline from Summit Lake, B.C. to Kitimat, B.C. And the spot that we're sitting in right here, right now, is a tenting area, but it's also the center point on a GPS coordinates for a right-of-way that they want to put through here. So we're occupying the lands and we're stopping PTP from coming in. This year's camp attracted over 150 people who came from as far east as Montreal and as far south as Florida. The camp organizers opted not to tap large environmental NGOs for material support and instead reached out to grassroots community-based allies. We were invited by Mel Basil and uh, later on by some of the other chiefs here um, to, to come and help them stand up against the pipelines. And we are all about stopping the pipelines at this point. We're all about doing indigenous solidarity and so this gets, we get to do both and we get to bring a bunch of people from Vancouver who maybe have never experienced an action camp or um, you know, being, being welcomed by First Nations people on their own territory. And they get to experience that. They get to um, learn new skills and share their own and um, share food and camaraderie and culture and uh, build something. You know, we built a small city here, practically, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and I think it's really good for everybody's morale. You know, because people feel like they can actually do something physically. They can physically do something to stop the pipelines. You know, and you can't get funding from Tides Canada or George Soros or any large foundation to do um, direct action training. Out of the proposed pipeline projects that will cross through Unistoten land, Pacific Trails is the first one slated to begin construction and poses an immediate threat. The PTP project is a partnership between Apache Canada and Canada and EOG Resources formerly known as Enron Oil and Gas. The 463-kilometer PTP pipeline will connect the liquefied natural gas port in the Pacific Ocean to the Spectra Energy West Coast Pipeline with the aim of transporting gas extracted through fracking to overseas markets. Others, like the Enbridge Northern Gateway Pipeline, would transport tar sands oil from Fort McMurray 
an extraction project that is devastating the nature and indigenous communities in the Athabasca region of northern Alberta. Sue Deranger is a member of the Athabasca Chippewayan First Nation who traveled from Fort McMary to show her solidarity with the Unistoten. They're blocking the Enbridge pipeline, which is going to haul the bitumen from our community that is, that is affecting our lives so intensely. The cancers that are there, the animals that are sick, the water that's polluted. It's, there's such a connection because if there's, if there's no tar sands, then there's no pipeline. If there's no pipeline, there's less for them to do. These dirty energy schemes not only threaten nature and indigenous people in the north, but also have global implications. If decisive action is not taken to stop the flows of oil and gas, the effects of global climate change could be catastrophic for people, plants, and animals all over the world. This is why natives and their allies travel from far away to come together at this camp. At this point, people know that, you know, I think most people realize that appealing to government, appealing to the Harper government or the BC government is really hopeless. And uh, the, only, the only real way to stop this, especially this particular pipeline, which is already approved, the way to stop it is, is going to be to actually shut them down, slow them down, cost them money, scare their investors away. And uh, this, this is going to involve, you know, going to do direct action. This camp is designed to create a culture of resistance. What we are doing is we are showing our young ones who are in this camp that there is peaceful resistance. There is also a uh, way of the warrior and there is also um, uncompromising stance. Our territories have never been ceded. We've never surrendered anything here. Uh, these, these territories belong to our people and we have no intention of giving it up or surrendering it to any entity. Just a few, a few quick things because I know time is running short. But, uh, uh, the first one is that if you if you really enjoy this event, there's an event, uh, a similar event just like it in Frida Togesta, you're going to be speaking there on Thursday at the Friendship Center. So tell your friends. It's a, it's a fall feast, anti-colonial uh, dinner, uh, and it's also free and there's also food. Um, number two, uh, the films that you watch here tonight uh, are all available on a DVD back there if you want to take them home with you and show your friends. Uh, and lastly, I, I, I really want to thank Freedom Togestai and all the folks at Unistoten for trusting me enough to let me document their struggles for the past five years. Uh, they're, they're very weary about how people mis mistreat what's happening there, how it gets misreported, and I really feel uh, truly honored that I've, been, that I've been allowed into the territory time and time again, and I've been able to, show, to share these stories with people outside of it. Um, this week, uh, probably on Thursday, maybe tomorrow, but probably on Thursday, uh, my latest uh, film of the Unestotem comes out on uh, Al Jazeera's AJ Plus, so uh, look out for that. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, and I think uh, Frida and Togesta are up next. So, so we're going to go on now with uh, Frida uh, Hewson, sorry, uh, spokesperson for the Onis Stoughton clan. Uh, but I would first like to mention that um, all the literature and patches and things sold at the table in the bag uh, will help us cover for the costs of this event. So feel free to, to go see what's there. Uh, so um, I will read you uh, Frida's biography. So she was chosen to be the spokesperson for the Onistoten clan in 2008 when the Onistoten separated from the tribal organization called the Office of the Wet'suwet'en. Her responsibilities as a spokesperson include holding meetings between her hereditary clan chiefs, perform liaison duties with industry and government, coordinate messages for media, and research all aspects of which are brought up for discussion re regarding clan business. 
Much of her grounding comes from being raised following their season seasonal hunting and fishing on her people's land and waterways. Some of her responsibilities continue to include planning and coordinating clan incursions out of their territorial, um, traditional territories. Frida's guiding philosophy is based on teachings taught to her and her family from her grandmother, the late Christine Holland. Uh, I'm sorry if I messed up her name. Sorry. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody that has come out tonight and thank the peoples whose territories we are on. And as you see in the videos, we've been doing this for over six years and we're in Northern British Columbia, one hour in from Houston, BC on a logging, remote logging road. So it's an hour in from the nearest municipality and we're two hours from the home community where I grew up in. So I grew up on a reservation, but three years ago made a choice to walk away from my job and go move out on to the, into our territories, into a cabin. As we felt that we could not monitor our territories from the reservation, that we had to be out on the lands to watch out for industry who was forcefully trying to come through our territories. Since we've been there, they have made many, many attempts via helicopter, via vehicles, trying to come onto the territory. And just this past summer, we had the threat that they were going to send in 200 police, similar as what you saw in Elsie Pogtog. They were planning to put 200 police in to try and remove us, but we managed to keep the peace and get the police to leave without any incident, just by being peaceful, by being calm, and not, not buying into their aggression, because they were being very aggressive, trying to get us to react, but we did not react, we just remained calm. We're able to calmly ask them to leave, calmly tell them that it wasn't Canada, it wasn't BC, that they didn't have no jurisdiction to try and just walk in, that that gate at the bridge was like my door. I told them that you need a warrant. I said, unless you got a warrant saying that you're gonna arrest somebody for some kind of crime that's been committed, you can't just bust in here and walk in here. So we managed to get them to leave and it was pretty heated. There was a lot of harassment from the police and it was stressful for our elders, stressful on us because it, it takes like exceedingly a lot of energy to remain calm, to remain peaceful, when meanwhile your blood is boiling because you know an unjust is being done to you, that you shouldn't have to keep proving these lands are yours. And created a lot of stress, and we had to go over and over again to calm everybody that was there because we had people from all over the world that come to help support us and people were stressed, people were nervous, people were scared of what the outcome might be because of C-51 people were afraid of being arrested because the police keep threatening they were going to arrest us saying that we were blocking a public road which we know it wasn't a public road because it's an old logging road so since when do they call logging roads public roads? And so with all the supports and the one thing we found that was really helpful was the alternative media that we continuously put out was what really helped us because all the world's eyes were on the police, on, on the industry that continually tried to make us look like the bad guys but we had all the footage to prove because uh, Coastal Gaslink kept coming in and keep asking us leading questions. Will we be, be harmed if we come in, come in here? And the reason why they kept asking those kind of questions is so that they could try and put a court injunction on us and use force to remove us. But we continue just to use that, that is unceded land that, that they don't have 
consent to come in, that you must have consent and you did not receive consent to come into our territory. So we just keep answering those questions and at one point I even said, do I look like I'm going to harm you? And he just said, absolutely not. And so we're going to continue to keep doing what we're doing and I know just based on media that Pacific Trails Pipeline, the, one of the frack gas companies, put out a media release that they didn't care that we were on their way and that we were stopping them, that they're going to still proceed with their project. And the thing that really blows me away that there's no market for the gas and the oil, the market has plummeted and yet they're still trying to proceed with these projects. And we were puzzled, we're saying, why are they still trying to go ahead with projects when there's no money in it for them? And just this past month, we got some information, like um, the province always sends us uh, what they call consulting letters. They just ask us if we have any concerns for the projects they're going to put forward. And they were one of the letters that we got said they wanted to re-divert water, they were going to give, issue out a permit and ask what our thoughts were on that. And when I saw that re-diverting water, that made me suspicious that they actually want our water. So if there's no money in oil and gas and they're wanting to re-divert water, and I had somebody tell me about the Water Act that was going to be passed in 2016 and said that I should actually research that. So I started looking into it and that new Water Act they're trying to pass is going to be exempt for oil and gas companies. But yet municipalities, agriculturists, all have to pay by the thousand cubic meter of how much, like the volume of water that you use, you will have to pay. And I checked into it how the water situation was in China, and they only have 20% of usable water left there because they've polluted all their waters through industry. And they now have to use very large pipes to transport water from southern China to northern China because in the north they've polluted all their water. So my belief is they're after our water now and possibly use the pipes the same way China is to pipe our water to the coast and then tanker it to whatever areas that are have wasted all their water via polluting it. To me, water is going to be the new gold where that people are going to be really, right now the government wants to commodify water too and make us pay for that so that that's another source that they can resource that they can try and own and make money off of it. So. I think we have bigger things to worry about now. We're coming into the time where we're on a downward spiral with the planet and people are not waking up fast enough. We're all part of the problem. We're all feeding into this economic wheel that's destroying our planet by buying all the items that take oil to produce and everything in this planet is requiring the resource and we all buy into it. So we're all part of the problem. And until we start making choices that reduces the dependency on, not, on these things, they're going to continue <laughs> saying they de de the demand is there. And we all need to do our homework and all figure out other ways because we know this planet can't sustain us and we know we can't go back to just relying on the land. We figured that out ourselves that we cannot sustain ourselves on the land so we got to think of other sound economics that's not going to destroy this planet but will help us as it's our children and grandchildren who are going to pay the price. Many of you may not have children yet but if you plan to have children what kind of future are they going to have? If there's no clean drinking water, there's no water to, for the agriculturists to grow the food, the grocery store shelves are going to go empty. What are they going to eat if they don't know how to grow their own food or if we don't even have water to grow it? So that's 
my suspicion that people are not going to wake up until everything is gone. And until we start doing something to make that change, there's not going to be much of a future for our children or our grandchildren. So we need to find new ways to not destroy this planet and to be able to sustain our water, our air, the land. So my family's doing what we can to go back to the land. And the one thing we were working on this past year is a healing center. Because to me, my people are, have been oppressed so long that a lot of our people are in substance abuse, where they're abusing alcohol or drugs, and there's high rates of suicides in our community. So we decided the government did their job to take the Indian out of our children by sending them to residential schools, by using the Ministry of Children and Families to remove our children and putting them in homes where our culture is not taught. So we wanted to do a healing center that we bring our youth out and put the Indian back in those children to do holistic healing through spiritual, mental, to help them be well-rounded so that if they are connected back to their culture, they will protect the land and they will make wise choices for the next generations. And my niece just finished her PhD in clinical psychology, so she said she wanted to focus on the youth. If we can make our youth healthy, then we'll have healthy leaders making healthy choices on our land so that it will be there for the next generations. So right now we have a fundraising campaign on Fundraise to raise funds for the second phase. We finished the first phase of the, the dining hall and the commercial kitchen where the food would be prepped. And the second phase is the counseling offices and uh, lobby. And then the third phase will be sleeping quarters for families to sleep in that come in to the healing center. So we thought this was a far off dream, but some group in Galliano Island came forward and helped fundraise for the first phase and then they're helping us with the second phase as well so that we have the facilities to help start healing our people so if we heal our people we'll heal our land. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frida. Uh, now we're going to hear uh, Togestai, and I'm going to uh, read you his biography. Uh, so Togestai is a traditionalist and grassroots land defender. He is a hereditary chief of the Wet'suwet'en Lak Laksama Sioux clan and has lived on the front lines for five and a half years. He is starting a new Wet'suwet'en frontline camp called the uh, Laksamasu Stronghold on his people's traditional territory, stopping all pipelines from starting construction. He is starting to assemble an indigenous solidarity network called the Indigenous People's Frontline Alliance. This alliance represents traditional her hereditary people battling development on their homelands using truly grassroots methods. So Togestai. As she said, my name is Togestai. I'm a hereditary chief of the Laksamasu clan. Uh, I come from the Sun House, and my people are the people of the sky. All of our crests are of the sky. Like uh, a lot of other clans have crests that are, that are animals and birds and stuff. Ours are um, rainbows, stars, sun, the moon, the clouds, the, everything from the sky, the wind. Um, that's, that's my people. We have a long history that connects us to our sisters and brothers on the matrilineal, matrilineal side, all the way from uh, Central America to Alaska. I was raised by my grandparents Sa'atne and Medik out in our traditional territories. I clearly remember you know, being three and four years old, riding with um, my grandparents and my late father and some of my uncles out on the territories through all of the seasons. We would be trapping in the winter. In the spring, we'd be hunting beaver. 
In the summer, we'd be out berry picking, catching salmon, uh, gathering medicines. In the fall, we'd be hunting again, uh, hunting for larger moose and going up in the mountains looking for groundhogs. You know, it was all the seasons that are people that, that, that we grew up, I, I, I grew up on, with my grandparents, with my dad and my, my uncles. And I remember clearly traveling out onto, onto the territories with them. And there was one spot, I was probably about seven years old, and uh, they, had a, they, they always had four by fours, old four by fours that were reliable. And uh, we'd go to really distant and remote parts of the territories. And uh, they were elderly, so they couldn't walk. So they'd take the roads out and they would stop in places and they would show me old trails. They'd tell me, walk in there. Walk for a half hour and come back and tell us what you've seen. So, so I'd walk into the bush and it looked like it was just like bush. And I'd start walking all of a sudden I hit a trail. And I was just fascinated. I'm like, how did they know this was here? This is a brand new road. Nobody's even driven out on this place before. But they would stop at a place and tell me, walk in there for a half hour and come back and tell me what you see. So I'd walk in there for a while and I'd come back and I'd say, well, I walked on it for 15 minutes and I came across an old camp. And I can tell it was an old camp because it had this, 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 and there's marks on the trees. And it was, it was my childhood. There was another spot that we stopped at. I used to, I used to fish for trout a lot. And uh, I was an avid fisherman. I used to have a little fishing rod that had folded up and went into my, my jacket pocket. And I had all my lures and stuff with me. And I remember there was a little beaver pond I used to, they used to stop at. They would uh, stop at the beaver pond and they would start a little fire, make a nice pot of tea. Uh, warm up some bannock and potatoes and salmon and I'd run into the bush to the little beaver pond and I'd come back with about six or seven trout enough to feed everybody that was there and we'd cook it in a frying pan and I remember them telling me once when we were sitting there cooking the trout that I just caught they would ask me uh, did you like it in there and I'd be like yes it's beautiful so what do you know about this place I said well I know there's trout over there and it's a really good fishing. And they said, well, you know this place because this is yours. This is where your ancestors are from. That place where you catch those trout and that beaver pond over there is a place that has belonged to your ancestors for a long time. It's also a marker on your territory that tells you where your boundary line is. And there's a mountain that you can see when you're standing at the beaver pond. If you go from the, if you draw a line from the beaver pond to the top of that mountain, that's your boundary line. And my grandmother, uh, my grandfather was paralyzed at this time, so he couldn't speak, so she would speak for him. And uh, she said, when you grow up, you have to look after this place. When you grow up, you have to protect this place. You have to pre protect the animals. You have to protect our way of life. And I didn't quite understand what she was talking about. I'd be like, okay, my boundary line, my territory, I have to protect it when I grow up. Okay, and I didn't really think much of it. And I became an adult, and I remember um, we were fighting for, uh, I was just a, in my early 20s, I was taking some courses back home, but I was also participating in some blockades that were happening. And the, her words came back to me. When you grow up, you have to look after it, you have to protect it. And that's something that uh, I, never, I never really thought of until that moment. Because she didn't ask me to go to the government and apply for a permit to go out into the territory to see if we could ask them for permission. She said, when you grow up, you have to look after your territory. That's your responsibility. You have to protect it. And I behaved like that since, since I realized that that little moment when her words came back to me and I had an epiphany. I suddenly remembered, you know, this is my responsibility as a Wet'suwet'en. So about uh, five and a half years ago, uh, about seven years ago, I started going to Frida, but uh, about five and a half years ago, we moved out into her territory. I, I committed myself to help her and her family to begin a campaign to go out and begin taking, ter taking care of their territories. And when I committed to that, I'm serious. Like, uh, my dad said, if you, if you say something, you always follow through. Because he said, uh, you, have, you always have to be a man of your word. 
when you say something and you make a promise, you make sure you can follow through with that promise. And that was something that I remembered also when I was a child growing up, you know, I committed to things and I would always follow through and I told Frida and her family that I would stay with them to help them occupy and protect their territories and assert themselves. So yeah, about five and a half years ago, we moved out into the territory and we started to kick out pipeline companies. Just prior to that, we were kicking out mining companies. There was a mining company that was attempting to travel into one of her territories to turn a beautiful inland lake that produced char, one of the last remaining pristine lakes that still produces char and lingcod. They wanted to turn this lake into a tailing spot. So we traveled out to that territory and we kicked out the exploration company that was in there and told them to leave. They left after five days because we told them, you have an ultimatum to get out of here after five days. If you don't get out of here, what you leave in here belongs to our people. So they packed up all of their stuff and they left. It was a huge victory for us. But two weeks after that company was kicked out, somebody came in and burnt a cabin down that belonged to Frida's family. That was devastating. We were in a process of um, planning to go back out into that territory to rebuild that cabin. It's a, one of the most beautiful and sacred places that belonged to her people. But we were also in the midst of trying to deal with these pipeline proposals. There was, uh, at the time, what we understood as LNG pipelines and oil pipelines. And they were attempting to apply for permits and go in and do work. They were coming in to do some baseline studies to begin the process of applying for permits to the BC government to work towards putting a pipeline through Wet'suwet'en territories. And I remember the first time we came across a drilling company, the drilling company had actually called my uncle. Uh, my uncle's name is Hlomkan. They phoned him up and they told him, um, it was young guys that were working for a drilling company. They phoned him up and said, our company is scheduled to go into your, into, into Unistotan territory soon. But the boss who's hired us is an asshole. He's disrespectful to the indigenous people. And he's incredibly disrespectful and we don't want to do the work for him. So if you want to stop the drillers, us, from going into that territory, we're scheduled to go in at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> it was an awkward time because um, a good friend of mine had just passed away about five five days before that, and I was supposed to, I was attending his wake at uh, in the community that Frida was talking about, and uh, it was difficult because if we were going to go out and deal with those drillers in that pipeline company, I would have to miss his funeral. So I thought about it for a while, and I just decided, you know, if there's any time to do something, it's now, and nobody else is going to step up. I can't sit back and wait for somebody else to do this for me or on my behalf. I have to get out and do it. So I, I sat down with my uncle and Frida's uncle, the two head chiefs of both of our clans, and I said, do you guys want me to go out there and deal with these guys at five o'clock in the morning? And they looked at each other and they had a discussion and they decided, yes, we're gonna, my uncle said, I'm gonna make the decision now that the Lakhsamasu clan, which is the clan I come from, is going to work together with the Unistotan, which is Frida's clan, and we're going to help stop these guys from coming in from this day forward. So yes, you have permission to go out and deal with these guys. So they both made the decision for me to organize a group of people to go out, and we did that. We got out there at 5 o'clock in the morning, and sure enough, the jeweler showed up and the pipeline worker showed up. They were surprised to see us. Um, there was a lot of fresh snow on the ground, and we were parked across the road, stopping it from coming in. And the bizarre thing about that moment was, we, we did manage to kick them up, like the, the, the pipeline guy said, okay, I'm sorry, um, we'll, we're gonna leave now. They got back in his truck and he started pulling away. The drillers came across the bridge because they had to turn around. And as they were turning their vehicle around, all the young guys that uh, were working for the company had their cameras up, they were taking pictures of us and they were giving us a thumbs up and you know, yelling, hooray, 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 yay! And it was bizarre because they were losing their jobs. <laughs> but they were willing to sacrifice themselves for that moment. 
like Frida said, there's a lot of stress out on that territory this summer. It was really difficult for us. Um, the, you know, you'd fall asleep at night and you'd wonder, am I going to wake up to violence that is going to either land me in prison or kill me? What, what lies ahead for me? And you'd lay, you'd lay there at night and before you go to bed, before you start closing your eyes and trying really hard to go to sleep, that thought would go through your brain. It was impossible to escape it. And the level of stress that your body goes through when you go through that kind of thing is amazing. It's incredibly high. But it didn't ever scare us enough to force us to back down. We're willing to do that. I want to quickly talk about a short story that my daughter shared with me. It's a story that, uh, that belongs to our Eastern neighbors, that's literally 10 people. And my good friend Dominic Frederick shared those with my daughter over the summer and she was helping build a pit house for the university. And she said, uh, when you get a chance to tell the story, tell it because it's important. People have to think about what are you willing to do to sacrifice for your future generations. In a story like this, it's, um, it's a short and condensed version of it. But uh, a long time ago, the Tene people were getting ready to do their salmon fishing out of the Fraser River. And uh, they, they built their fishing weir and they got all of their fishing equipment all ready. And they got the fishing weir across the river and they set all their traps. And the fishermen were all geared up. They had their smokehouses restocked. All the tools and equipment were there. The people were ready, completely ready to deal with the salmon when the salmon came. But the salmon didn't come. This one year, the salmon did not come. They waited and they waited and they waited. And all of a sudden, one salmon showed up and he watched it go through the fishing weir, and they let it go. And they kept thinking there's going to be more coming. And he waited and he waited and another salmon showed up another day. And they're wondering what happened to all the salmon. They waited and the salmon slowly trickled up through the weir and they decided not to catch any. When it came close to the end of the fishing season, when the salmon was supposed to have gone through, they realized there was no salmon coming that year. And they had to make a decision. Are we going to catch any salmon to feed our people for this winter? So the entire community sat down, probably like five times larger than this group, sat down and talked about this. And they all unanimously made a decision that we're not going to catch any salmon this year. And that fateful decision wiped out half of the population of the that winter. They died of starvation. They made that decision knowing what the consequences were going to be. And my friend Dominic Frederick asked, what are you willing to do to save the salmon for your future generations? Would you do what my people did? It's an important question to contemplate because, like Frida said, humanity's gone past that tipping point now. We're losing everything in the ocean. Species are dying at an alarming rate. For crying out loud, they're dumping sewage in the St. Lawrence River where the belugas come in. They give birth to their babies here. All the Atlantic salmon are coming and spawn up here. <coughs> the babies that spend time in the estuary you know, they're, they're falling victim to human greed and human mismanagement. What are each and every one of you willing to do to help your unborn generations? What sacrifice are you willing to do to make sure that the future is secured? But I'd like to kind of leave you with that because that's really important. You know, we're in a process of trying to protect some incredibly beautiful and pristine areas back home. And that's what we have to think about. That's what we contemplate. And as far as we're concerned, we're going to do everything it has, we have to do to protect these places. And we're proving it on the ground. And we're asking you guys to consider the same. How what's up?
very much to Castanet. André Picoutlecan est Marie-Hélène Parent. André, c'est un nouveau traditionnaliste de Pessamite qui, pour être en accord avec ses croyances spirituelles, a décidé de militer pour l'environnement et pour conscientiser les Premières Nations. Et Marie-Hélène Parent, c'est une artiste métisse en multimédia interactif qui est également une militante en environnement contre le pétrole et les gaz de schiste. Alors, euh, je vous donne la parole. Euh, bonsoir à tous. Est-ce que ce serait possible d'avoir euh, un peu plus d'éclairage comme tantôt euh... Quelques-unes de mes notes sont faites euh, en crayon de blond. Euh, génial. Merci. Euh, D'abord, je voudrais me préciser que euh, Marilyn et moi, euh, ça fait à peu près deux ans et un peu plus qu'on milite. Et en tant que tel, euh, on fait quand même... Euh, un bon travail. Et dans la vie de tous les jours, on est un couple bêtissé. Euh, D'abord, avant de commencer à euh, parler d'Anticosti, parce que c'est surtout pour euh, protéger l'île euh, qu'on milite, on, la, on essaie de la protéger contre la fracturation. Euh, je vais faire d'abord une petite chronologie euh, de certains événements euh, en lien avec euh, le territoire. Parce qu'au niveau des Premières Nations Innu, je sais que dans d'autres nations, c'est la même chose. Euh, mais je veux spécifiquement parler de ma nation. Il euh, y a une crise entre euh, un esprit moderne de marchander le territoire et pour d'autres de vouloir la conserver et la protéger parce que c'est un territoire ancestral. Vous, en, vous avez sûrement entendu parler de euh, plusieurs blocus euh, chez les Inno. Euh, certains, ça date de, des années 90, ça date de plus que ça, mais je vais me limiter aux années 90 et plus récents. Euh, il y a eu, entre autres, pour le projet de barrage sur la Sainte-Marguerite, euh, sur la rivière Sainte-Marguerite, euh, il y a un projet SM3 euh, qui, a eu, qui a vu le jour. Des Inuits de Wahat Manutenam, qui se trouvent à cette île, euh, ont voulu bloquer. Euh, ils ont manifesté leur opposition euh, au barrage pour protéger leur, le le, leur territoire. Euh, ça s'est soldé par des arrestations. Et euh, au niveau du conseil de bande, euh, le conseil de bande a fait ce qu'ils ont l'habitude de faire, c'est de négocier, marchander le territoire euh, et avec un référendum. Euh, ont réussi à obtenir un contrat. Euh, je préciserai que euh, Wahat Manutenam, Wahat, euh, c'est la partie de la réserve qui se trouve collée à la ville de cette île. Et Manutenam est à peu près, peut-être une vingtaine de kilomètres un, un peu plus loin. Et les trois quarts, non, euh, les deux tiers de Wahat ont voté pour. Euh, avec le, pour le euh, pour l'entendre. Et du côté de Maniotenam, euh, les deux tiers ont voté contre. Mais parce que la ville, euh, la partie qui est collée à la ville avait un peu plus d'habitants, c'est le oui qui l'a emporté et euh, le territoire a été d'une certaine manière vendu. Euh, ensuite, euh, il y a eu chez moi euh, il y a eu une, un autre projet de barrage hydroélectrique. Euh, C'est dans le milieu des, des, des années 90. Euh, il y a eu une entente avec le chef de l'époque, qui est le chef actuel présentement, René Simon. Euh, je noterai que c'est un très bon administrateur, mais au niveau de sa vision du territoire, euh, euh, je ne suis pas en accord avec lui. Euh, il y a eu un blocus euh, fait par Mike McKenzie, qui était conseiller à l'époque. C'est toujours à Mani, euh, Wahat Manutena. Euh, comme Hydro-Québec euh, et Québec ne voulaient pas négocier avec euh, le conseil de bande euh, à ce moment-là, parce que le conseil de bande en tant que tel avait perdu de la crédibilité, euh, ils étaient en déficit et euh, une très mauvaise gérance, euh, pour obliger Hydro-Québec à... à négocier pour avoir une entente. Si je ne me trompe pas, c'est sur les euh, lignes hydroélectriques. Oui. Euh, 
il y a eu un blocus. Euh, comme il n'y avait pas, pas tant de, 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 de supporters, parce que dans le fond, c'est le conseil de bande qui l'a organisé, ils ont invité les traditionnalistes à intégrer euh, le blocus pour protéger l'unité d'assinant. Euh, même méfiant, les traditionnalistes ont quand même accepté, sont allés manifester, sont allés aider euh, le blocus. Et après quelques jours, euh, il y a eu une signature de 10 millions entre Hydro-Québec et le conseil de bande. Le conseil de bande a retiré ses, euh, ses supporters, laissant tout seul les traditionnalistes qui voulaient continuer à défendre l'unité d'assinant. Euh, ça s'est soldé par euh, euh, des arrestations et en majorité euh, c'était des femmes. Euh, et euh, même euh, cette histoire-là est toujours en cours présentement. Euh, là, présentement, le chef actuel c'est Mike McKenzie, euh, l'organisateur du blocus. Euh, et euh, récemment élu, il y a eu un autre blocus euh, contre le plan Nord. Et euh, ça s'est soldé encore par des arrestations, euh, deux ou trois, je me... peut-être quatre. Et euh, toujours sans euh, l'appui du conseil de bande euh, qu'ils ont abandonné, vu que les, les ententes ont, ont été signées. Euh, ensuite, euh, au Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean, à, à Mastoyache, il y a eu euh, le chef Gilbert Dominique qui a fait une entente pour... Euh, euh, la construction du mini central hydroélectrique sur la rivière, euh, on, je ne me rappelle plus le nom de la rivière, mais il euh, euh, y avait des environnementalistes et euh, Inou de, de Mastoyage qui ont voulu protéger la rivière. Et en particulier, euh, une très belle chute qui s'appelle la chute de Vajolbert. Oui. Bon. Euh, L'entente a été signée, la, euh, le, le barrage a été euh, construit. Euh, cette année, euh, il y a eu deux blocus venant de Pagwashipi. Euh, le, le premier blocus, c'est toujours sur la même histoire, c'est qu'à Churchill Falls, euh, au Labrador, euh, il y a un projet de, de construction de chute et de euh, ligne hydroélectrique. Et euh, bon... Le conseil de bande a voulu me bloquer, non, a bloqué une route, la 510 au Labrador. C'était un hiver, euh, ben, il y avait de la neige, c'était le mois de mars. Et ça a duré peut-être deux, trois jours. Euh, il y a eu une entente avec euh, le, le gouvernement de la province de Terre-Neuve pour euh, comment, entreprendre les négociations. Ils ont accepté, euh, ça a abouti, a abouti à nulle part, à rien. Euh, le chef Denis Mestenapéo est venu sur le territoire euh, de Bessamit, sur une route qui s'appelle la 389, qui relie Bécomo à Manic 5 et qui va jusqu'au euh, au Labrador. Euh, le blocus. Oh. Ok. Euh, le blocus, ça s'est soldé par. Euh, comme euh, Denis Mestenapéo n'a pas demandé la permission au chef de relissement de Bessamit. Celui-ci euh, lui a dit de lever le camp. Euh, il y a également, plus récemment, euh, blocus de Joël Malek pour euh, le chantier de la Romaine. Même chose, c'était pour euh, avoir des contrats. Euh, Minarno, euh, la ville de Sétil, euh, non pas la ville de Sétil, euh, Wattman Yutanam n'a euh, pas son, a pris aucune position. Euh, puis comme le projet a été accepté, euh, si ça se fait, euh, ils vont euh, vite demander des compensations financières. Euh, puis en 2010, par chez nous, euh, entente avec euh, trois minières, euh, une pétrolière. Euh, là, pour aller un peu plus euh, vite, euh, je vais résumer qu'il y a une crise présentement, c'est que les conseils de bande, même s'ils font des blocus, c'est pas pour vous défendre le territoire. Ils vont utiliser comme exemple... Euh, euh, qu'on se fait voler, mais eux-mêmes participent à ce vol. Euh, aucun d'eux, pratiquement, euh, ne veut protéger le territoire. Euh, tout ce qu'ils font, c'est de marchander, et dont un, entre autres, le, Jean, le chef Jean-Charles Pétachot de Mingan, fait la même chose avec Anticosti. Euh, et euh, là, je pourrais parler un peu de, de, du dossier d'Anticosti. 
En fait, c'est ce qui nous euh, réunit, euh, moi et euh, André. Euh, ma lutte commence pour Anticosti en, en mai 2010, lorsque j'ai découvert les permis de gaz et pétrole dans la vallée du Saint-Laurent et jusqu'aux îles de la Madeleine, jusqu'à Old Harry. Euh, dans mon esprit, pour euh, faire une histoire courte, euh, dans mon esprit et dans mon, euh, dans mon expérience, euh, mon père étant allé à Anticosti en 1975 pour faire le survol des ressources avec mon oncle ingénieur. Anticosti était une île... Euh, sauvage, euh, protégé, euh, il n'y aurait pas d'exploitation de, là de quoi que ce soit, sauf euh, un grand parc qui est euh, aussi une réserve euh, écologique et un endroit pour chasser. Euh, quand j'ai vu les, euh, les plans d'exploitation qui couvraient toute la vallée du Saint-Laurent jusqu'aux îles de la Madeleine, en passant par Anticosti aussi, je me suis dit, ça n'a pas de bon sens, ça fait 40-50 ans qu'on dit qu'on doit abandonner les, hydro les hydrocarbures. Euh, Qu'est-ce que le Québec a à foutre à exploiter des hydrocarbures? On est dans l'eau, le soleil, le vent. Qu'est-ce qu'on va faire dans les hydrocarbures à détruire le territoire qui nous reste et qui est encore pur à 90 disons? Euh, moi, j'avais été en Chine en 2008. J'ai été malade tout le long. Je n'étais pas capable de respirer. J'avais de la difficulté, des difficultés respiratoires. L'eau était complètement polluée. Le Yangtze, la rivière, le, le, le fleuve Yangtze est rouge. Les montagnes sont bleues. Euh, L'univers est... Moi, je suis une, une artiste. Donc, pour moi, je suis une artiste photographe. En plus, pour moi, c'était comme un paysage à l'envers, un paysage négatif. Euh, le, le dauphin qui est dans cette rivière-là est, est éteint. Je suis revenue de là en me disant euh, « Wow! Qu'est-ce qu'on est en train de faire? Qu'est-ce qui se passe? » Et en me disant « Il faut absolument que nous, on prenne conscience au Québec de ce qu'on a encore, de ce, de ce qu'on a encore euh, comme, euh, comme nature euh, et qu'on peut encore, dont on peut encore faire l'expérience. » Est-ce que beaucoup d'entre nous avons fait l'expérience de boire de l'eau directe dans la rivière? On peut le faire sur Anticosti. Est-ce que beaucoup d'entre nous ont fait l'expérience de n'entendre que le vent dans les arbres, rien d'autre, d'être seul sur une plage pendant des kilomètres de long? Est-ce qu'on voudrait vivre ça comme expérience? Est-ce qu'on veut préserver ça? du monde qui nous entoure. On a des choix à faire. Ici, je vois qu'on a des choix à faire. J'ai besoin d'eau pour parler. J'ai besoin d'eau pour vivre. Ça m'est servi dans un verre de plastique. Le plastique, c'est du pétrole. Ça, c'est du pétrole. Probablement que dans mes vêtements, il y a du pétrole. Est-ce que vraiment, ce pétrole-là, on en a besoin tous les jours? Est-ce qu'on peut faire des efforts? Est-ce qu'on peut faire des efforts pour Anticosti? En passant, vous avez tous des iPhones. Peut-être que vous pouvez aller voir la pétition, elle est encore en ligne. Je l'ai gardée ouverte, je l'ai déposée en 2013, hein? 2013, avec 26 000 signatures. Je l'ai gardée ouverte pour garder une épine dans le pied du gouvernement du Québec. Elle est rendue à 38 000. Demain, je la dépose pour la deuxième fois, prise 2, à l'ES Hydrocarbures qui euh, est en ce moment l'évaluation environnementale stratégique que le gouvernement du Québec a mis sur pied. Les rapports qu'on y voit sont des rapports structurés sur euh, la rentabilité du, de l'exploitation du pétrole et du gaz sur Anticosti. On a des belles colonnes de chiffres. Je ne sais pas s'il y en a d'entre vous qui sont des économistes ou des, euh, des comptables, mais on sait que des rapports, hein, ça peut prendre toutes sortes de directions. Dans une colonne, il y a les, les colonnes de chiffres de rentabilité, il y a les, les colonnes de dépenses, puis il y a les colonnes externalités. Qu'est-ce que sont les externalités? Ce sont les impacts environnementaux, c'est les êtres vivants auxquels il n'y a pas de chiffres. Alors, il y a des chiffres dans une colonne de revenus, il y a des chiffres dans une de colonne de dépenses, 
Les deux balancent très bien. On va faire des profits au Québec avec ça. Sauf que dans la colonne impact environnemental, c'est drôle comme les êtres vivants n'ont pas, pas de prix, eux autres, ils n'ont pas de chiffres. Moi, j'en veux des chiffres. Je veux savoir une vraie valeur sur le golf quand il va être contaminé. C'est quoi la valeur du saumon atlantique qui est là quand il va être éteint? C'est quoi la valeur des, des forêts rasées? Le poumon de la terre, c'est aussi au Québec. Je veux voir du monde se lever pour vrai, moi, au Québec. Ça fait 5-6 ans qu'on lutte, que plein de gens luttent. Il faut qu'on prenne conscience de ce qu'on fait. Les gens ici parlaient de générations à venir. Il n'y a pas juste les Autochtones, il y a aussi nous autres hein, qui ont des générations à venir. Merci. Vous avez peut-être entendu parler d'une coalition politique entre trois nations, Inu, Mi'kmaq et Malicit, pour protéger le golfe du Saint-Laurent euh, des, euh, des hydrocarbures. Euh, le gros problème, c'est que ils ont volontairement exclu Anticosti. Et Anticosti, le son sous-sol est très friable. C'est poreux. Euh, en cas de problème, non. Quand ils vont installer des puits, il va y avoir des fuites, c'est inévitable. Euh, et ça va se répandre partout à travers euh, le, le golfe. C'est plusieurs nations euh, qui vont être affectées. C'est pas juste trois euh, nations autochtones, il y a aussi euh, les Québécois et... Euh, les Français à Saint-Pierre et Miquelon. Et euh, veut, veut pas, en excluant euh, Anticosti, il, les conseils de bande continuent à faire ce qu'ils ont toujours fait, c'est utiliser le territoire pour marchander, négocier. Euh, en excluant Anticosti, euh, ils demandent vraiment leur volonté euh, de signer des ententes. Et quoi qu'ils fassent, euh, ils essaieront toujours de masquer ça par de belles paroles. Comme dans un blocus, c'était marqué dans une banderole très bien faite. Euh, les droits des Premières Nations passent par, le respect, euh, par la protection du Nitacinan. Ce blocus-là, euh, cette banderole-là servait à, pour faire de la déforestation avant d'inonder euh, un vaste territoire sur la rivière euh, La Romaine. Et euh, ce conseil de bande-là n'a euh, rien fait pour empêcher... Euh, la construction du barrage. En gros, les conseils de bande veulent, c'est un droit légitime, donner des emplois et euh, avoir de l'argent pour leur population. Le problème, c'est qu'ils prostituent euh, la, la terre-mer. Et euh, j'inviterai les gens, quand vous verrez un blocus et qui est euh, organisé par un conseil de bande, méfiez-vous. Il y a toujours une question d'argent en dessous. Merci. Uh, Andre and Marie-Hélène. Uh, so now we're going to have a question period. Um, so um, Mathilde is going to be taking the speaking turns. So you just have to lift your hand and speak loudly. Ma deuxième question aussi, je veux savoir si, euh, avec le nouveau gouvernement en place, avec Trudeau, est-ce que, euh, est que ça vous donne de l'espoir aussi, parce qu'il semble là établir des relations positives avec les peuples autochtones, et puis il semble, semble avoir une approche très différente que euh, Harper. Donc, je voulais savoir nos commentaires là-dessus. Merci. Il y a quelqu'un d'entre vous qui voudrait répondre à cette question, euh, aux deux questions, à l'une d'entre elles? C'est 
peut-être pas, te passer le micro, je sais pas. So the one about the pipeline. Um, the Keystone XL pipeline was rejected by Obama recently, and even more recently, the Trudeau government, uh, shortly after being elected into office, announced that they were going to kill the Northern Gateway pipeline project, and now there's a ban on oil tankers on the coast. Um, that doesn't really help us on the West Coast. Because we knew from the beginning, those of us who've been involved in this fight against pipelines for a while, we knew since the beginning that the Northern Gateway Pipeline Project was a project that was destined to be killed anyways. It was a red herring for the governments and the populations to play with so that people were given a false sense of victory. We are fighting fracking pipelines. These pipeline projects are largely being ignored. The biggest front on the West Coast against pipeline and petroleum development with First Nations people who are on the front lines right now, including Leilu Island, Maddie Lee Camp, Unistotan Camp. The main fight right now is against fracking pipelines and fracking plants on the coast. We don't want fracking tankers. The Haida just announced recently that they are going to be opposing all LNG projects. The Simshan have Lilo Island. The Madi Li are fighting three proposed pipelines through their territories that are all fracking pipelines. And us, the Wet'suwet'en people, are fighting five separate fracking pipeline projects that are proposed to be going through our territories. All of these projects are being largely ignored by the population. They're being ignored by the government, they're being ignored by the media. <coughs> so in terms of like those projects and those victories against those projects and whether or not they give us hope, they, they give us an idea of what the government is willing to sacrifice in terms of ec economic productivity. But it doesn't really give us any hope in determining whether or not the fight that we have right now is going to be respected by those who are attempting to make decisions. And I think Frida wants to answer the other question about the Trudeau government. For a lot of our people, we believe that the political structure that is in place is the main reason that our planet's in trouble. The reason being that it's a failed system because industry is partners with the government. They go hand in hand because industry is the people that puts the money forward for the political parties to run their campaign. And then in return, the government has to create legislation, create policies to accommodate industry. So they both work together. And that's why I said that our people have a really hard time trying to battle because these guys have all the money, they have all the resources at their disposal. And we are the little guys that have to continuously prove in the court systems that we own these lands, that we were here for thousands of years before colonizations and our system protected the land. We only took what we need. We always gave back. And then since colonization, this governance structure that took over and started managing, mismanaging our resources, I say, and that system is failing and has been failing for a long time. 
and the only way I see us saving our planet is if this system is dismantled and we go back to our own ways. Our ways always protected the land, we protected the water, we protected the air, because if we didn't protect it, then we ourselves would not survive. So the system has failed, and I don't believe there will be any change with the new government structure in there, because deficits will remain, and as many promises as they try to make to us, they can't keep those promises because everything's already set. Everything is already in place, and they're not going to make like massive changes, otherwise they'll get the elite 1% angry at them, because pretty much that's all the governance structure is for the elite, because that's only people that it benefits. The people that are the industry, the government, that get all the tax breaks and get to make all the decisions, and everybody else has to pay for it. Well, she's pretty much answered everything that I thought in the same way because we're, we have that same approach of um, coming from a traditional front, uh, guided by the, by the people, uh, the elders, with the one with the knowledge. So this is why we also will keep um, making our governance known that we, we are working on it. We, are, we want it to be in place because it's the only way it's going to protect our lands. And, I did not vote during the federal election because if I vote, then that takes me, that takes away my sovereignty, my ability to speak for my sovereignty. This is where I chose, um, as uh, taught in the Eight Fire Prophecy, uh, which a lot of you probably know and read by now, that there has to be a new path in life for that new, uh, somewhat of a new world order or a new way of living. There has to be a new path. And to me, this is what I, I see as that new path for our people. So, good. Uh, I think I will answer my, uh, answer my question. Ask, ask my question first. Then you can answer What do you think settlers can do best and can do to fight both colonization and ecological destruction? And also, uh, we are working already on a network about those questions. And uh, we have a list on the, in the back, so people can uh, give their contacts. And I want to say miigwech to everybody who participated tonight event and also to the tour and organize. Uh, I can only share my ideas of how we've had settler people um, help. Uh, some of the things that, that we did for us was uh, we teamed up with um, what we call Solidarity Nobro, and these people would help um, publicize <coughs> what needs to be done. You know, we had to have our own media because the media would not cover uh, the true story that comes from the people themselves. And there's always going to be boycotts and things like that. People preventing us from speaking uh, what we wanted to bring out more to the public. So my ways, my thoughts on how can they help? It's you know start thinking. I don't know. Uh, my biggest interest right now is to see uh, the hemp to be used to to replace the wood products and to replace the oils and things like that. And there's a lot of uh, medicinal use that could be used for that. For that. These are some things that you can start looking at, you know, like trying, trying to push for this to, to come uh, as the new, as part of that new um, way of life that way, you know, like it's, it's, uh, it's easier on the earth and so on. But if you keep supporting uh, the lead of the indigenous people across the land, I think that's a very um, 
get start whether they they want to whether they want to make videos whether they want to to have journalists come in uh, whether if it's a private or um, just a, a regular person willing to write a story you know th these are some ways that I that I can see um, settlers helping our people but I'm sure Ifrida would probably have more ideas as well. Well, I'm sure many of you can't be on the front lines, but you have some kind of skills that you can use from right where you are. There's many ways that you can educate yourself, educate other peoples around you about these industries and how they're destroying the land and if we don't do anything about it that we're destroying ourselves. And the number one thing I keep sharing with people, if you've got marketing skills, if you know anything about economics, there are alternatives to oil and gas and people should be using that to educate others and use your marketing skills because the oil and gas companies use it with all their resources at their disposal. They tell people that frack gas is natural, it's clean, it's safe. We need to use the skills, other people that have these skills to educate people the truth with the truth and get it out there. It uh, doesn't cost money to put it up on your Facebook page or on any websites to just educate people because the more people are educated the more informed decisions they will make and more pressure they will put on leadership to make the right kind of decisions and can check out people's web page on what kind of help they need and truthfully the number one reason why the 200 police didn't knock down our gate and remove us from our territory is because we had tons of settler support because if it was just my people like I said they would have just pushed us out of the way so the more ways you can support it doesn't have to be us any kind of frontline work that's even happening right in your own backyard ask the indigenous people what kind of help what kind of supports can I help you with I have this 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 skills is it of any use to you can I help you in any way that I can and the more people that have skills that work together because nobody is a profession a professional and everything so everybody's got a skill that could be useful to make change happen and may look small to you but it could be big to other people and whatever skills you might have to help other people to make change and you can say you are part of change you are part you're the part of the reason why change was made and for the future of your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. You can be part of history making on making this change so that we can have a clean water, clean air, and land to still say that it's gonna be there for the next generation because we're all responsible. It shouldn't be just an indigenous problem, it's everybody's problem. Yeah, um. yeah uh, last year when um, Harper uh, approved the Enbridge uh, Northern Gateway Pipeline, uh, I interviewed, I interviewed y'all and I just wanted to hear you once again say like you had a whole bunch of different uh, um, promises from people who who said that they would do such and such if you guys were attacked by, by the police. And maybe as a way to sort of give us inspiration, maybe you can say like, you know, what that was again, like what were the promises that people gave you as a form of solidarity if uh, you guys were attacked by, by the Harper government back then? When we were asked that question on what we would do if the 
if a push came to shove and we had a lot of solidarity and people that came forward and said that, for example, if those 200 police came and just bulldozed through and removed us from our territory, we had a lot of people say that in solidarity they would shut down major highways, they would shut down railways to show support to our people and show disagreement on what the government is trying to do our pe to our people in order to push their projects through anyways. So that was what a lot of people said they would do and they would do all kinds of different solidarity wherever they were at because even just one hour shutting down a major highway impacts the economy and you will get the message across. So a lot of people said they would do that, things like that to help us if the government still insists on pushing these projects through even though we were trying to do everything we can to prevent those projects from happening. I wanted to mention one more thing. Um, the, the video you saw earlier talked about the Pacific Shores Pipeline and the main investors that were a part of that. All of those investors are gone. They bailed on the Pacific Shores Pipeline project. They left it. Apache, EOG, and Encana all walked away from it. They got rid of their investments and they gave it to Chevron. Chevron, as you may have learned over the last few months, was given approval by the Canadian Supreme Government, um, not they were given, but the Ecuadorian government was given approval by the Canadian Su uh, Supreme Court of Canada to sue Chevron. Um, Chevron still wants to try and push that pipeline through. Um, if we're going to hit them where it hurts, now's the time to do it. Chevron, TransCanada, they have offices, they have investor offices, they have subsidiary investor offices all over the place, including here in Montreal and Toronto and Ottawa and Vancouver and all over the states. If we're going to do any damage to their investors' confidence level, now's the time to do it. Because if we don't do anything this winter to hurt them in their pocketbook, they're going to show up at the camp fully armed with their police forces backing them up to try and force their way through the territory and you're going to see a confrontation. If we can plan around avoiding that situation from unfolding, now's the time to do it. Ma question est pour Philippe. Euh, J'espère que je ne le mets pas dans l'embarras. Mais j'aimerais savoir, euh, depuis qu'il est arrivé euh, ici, euh, quelle différence et quel euh, lien commun Il a pu constater entre euh, leur action de résistance et ce qui se passe ici. Durant le parcours que j'ai eu en Québec, y aquí las comunidades indígenas es que tenemos una conciencia, que tenemos un principio de defender el territorio, la madre tierra. Tenemos también un principio de luchar de acuerdo a sus dinámicas y sus procesos que tiene cada pueblo indígena. Esa es la conciencia que hay. Pero la diferencia es que cada proceso tiene sus procesos de lucha de cómo se defiende, ¿cierto? Allá en Colombia... En mi tournée en Québec, ici, avec les communautés autochtones, j'ai vu qu'on coïncidait dans le fait de protéger le territoire, la terre mère, dans le fait de lutter en accord avec les processus qui sont propres à chacun de nos peuples. Chaque, processus a, euh, chaque communauté a son propre processus, sa propre lutte. También, lo importante es la identidad de un pueblo. 
a través de la, de la cultura, a través de sus usos y costumbres, a través de la espiritualidad. Y en eso se consigue los pueblos indígenas. Porque si no conservamos esos elementos tan importantes, un pueblo puede desaparecer. Y es importante fortalecerlo. Eh, L'important d'un peuple, c'est son identité, qu'on retrouve dans sa culture, dans les us et coutumes, dans sa spiritualité. Et en ça, on coïncide les différentes communautés autochtones. Si on ne défend pas cette identité, nous, les peuples autochtones, on disparaîtra. En Colombia, la différence est que il y a un problème politique et social. Hay, hay muchas normas, pero las normas están a favor también del gobierno. Y nosotros hemos conseguido que los procesos, los derechos que nosotros hemos ganado en Colombia, no lo ha, ganado, no, no lo ha regalado el gobierno, lo hemos ganado nosotros porque hemos colocado muertos, hemos colocado sangre, hemos tenido asesinatos de varios líderes. Y por eso, para nosotros es algo muy importante legitimar estos procesos. Acá... En Colombia, les différents, euh, la différence de problématique... Non. En Colombia, la différence, c'est que la problématique est politique et sociale. Il y a plusieurs normes, mais elles sont en faveur du gouvernement. Nous sommes en... Pro... Nous, depuis les processus, les différents processus de mobilisation, nous disons que les droits que nous avons gagnés, ce n'est pas le gouvernement qui nous les a donnés. Nous les avons gagnés et malheureusement, ça nous a coûté du sang, ça nous a coûté les assassinats de plusieurs de nos leaders. La autre différence est que les peuples indigènes ici en Colombie eh, ne commercialisent pas. le cas de los Uba, ne commercialisent pas el recurso, no comercializa la madera, no, com no vende, porque es una, pro es una pelea política vertical. Para los pueblos autóctonos en Colombia, la diferencia es que no hacemos nada de comercio. Por ejemplo, para los les Ua, mi pueblo, no hacemos el comercio de nuestros recursos. No nos vende. Pero acá eh, hay una diferencia de que los pueblos indígenas para sobrevivir dependen del recurso natural, como es la madera, porque no hay de dónde más sobrevivir. Pero aquí hay una diferencia, porque los pueblos autóctonos viven de la explotación de ciertas recursos, como el bois, por ejemplo. Y es, no dependen, y es una parte también mostró debilidad, ¿no? pero sin embargo, lo importante es que se explote la madera planificadamente y también forestando eh, cuando se corte ¿no? la madera ¿no? para seguir teniendo como dice ese equilibrio en la naturaleza porque to si acabamos todo perderíamos el equilibrio de la, de la naturaleza es donc una faiblesse également mais par exemple lorsqu'il est question d'exploiter le bois il faut le faire de façon planifiée il faut prévoir la reforestation, par exemple, pour garder un équilibre dans la nature. Sinon, on met fin à cet équilibre. Euh, je pense qu'il y avait Marc-André qui avait une question. Juste un petit ajout de la part de Felipe d'une... Un exemple de mobilisation en Colombie. Qui est le cas de la Faro comme mobilisation. Un exemple de mobilisation. Para el pueblo colombiano, uno de los procesos importantes que nosotros llevamos en Colombia es el tema de movilización o paro. Mucha gente aquí no entiende ese significado. Hay momentos. Cuando hablamos de paro, es irnos a un paro cívico, cerrar vías, cerrar eh, comercialización, eh, posiblemente el comercio, y bloquear políticamente 
las vidas terciarias, secundarias del país. Es un paro nacional que, que a todo mundo queda para, paralizado. Mientras una movilización... Et pour le, en Colombie, il y a un processus important de mobilisation qu'on appelle le paro. Et ici, il y a plusieurs gens qui ne connaissent pas ça. Et le paro, ça, ça a lieu à certains moments lorsque euh, tous ensemble, on va bloquer les routes, on va empêcher toute commercialisation, on va même fermer les commerces, on va tenter de faire fermer à la grandeur de, 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 de tout le pays tout ce qui est l'industrie tertiaire, tous les services. Bref, on va paralyser l'économie au complet du pays. Mientras una movilización es yo ir con un grupo de indígenas, ejemplo, salir de acá, de Montreal, a Quebec, caminando, es una movilización, ¿cierto? Y gritando uh, las consignas y, por qué, y la exigencia, ¿no? Alors que eh, la diferencia, on fait également des mobilizaciones, la diferencia, ça va être plutôt une marche, par exemple, de Montréal a Quebec, où on va eh, crier nos, nos revendications, faire connaître notre point de vue. Y una toma pacífica es tomarme una institución, un ministerio, una institución del gobierno. Es una toma pacífica, algo específico. Et puis, un autre moyen d'action euh, qu'on utilise, c'est euh, l'occupation pacifique, l'occupation d'une institution gouvernementale, un ministère, par exemple, c'est une action spécifique. Pero las dos últimas, allá en Colombia ya no tiene sentido. Entonces, el primero sí tiene sentido, porque es bloquear los intereses económicos de un país que es un paro cívico. Mais on est en train de voir que les deux dernières actions, donc mobilisation ou occupation, n'ont plus trop de sens en ce moment en Colombie, que c'est vraiment la première, euh, le blocage économique complet du pays qui fonctionne. Entonces, esa es la diferencia que hay. Desde ya, los convoco a que estén en la expectativa del año entrante. El año entrante nos vamos a una actividad de, de, de paro nacional en contra de la minería, en contra de las políticas neoliberales, en contra del plan de desarrollo nacional y también en contra del despojo. Alors, c'est un peu la différence dans nos, nos mobilisations, puis je vous invite toutes et tous à être attentifs. L'année prochaine, en Colombie, on compte s'en aller dans une activité de paro, donc de bloquer tout le pays pour... Contre, en fait, de bloquer contre la politique minière, les politiques néolibérales, le plan de développement national, bref, le saccage de nos ressources. Et pour nous, algo muy importante, por ejemplo, mi persona, comentarles esto a ustedes, y que abramos lazos de comunicación, abramos también alianzas en la página web, en, la, en, en internet, que conozcan la realidad y ojalá que sean también observadores de este proceso para que el gobierno no reprima tanto a la población civil, campesina, indígena y afrodescendientes. Alors c'est important pour nous, en fait pour moi en ce moment, de vous exprimer ça, de, de vous dire euh, ce qui va se passer pour qu'on puisse créer des, des moyens de communication, des canaux entre nous, que ce soit par des pages web, etc.